Hey, what's going on everyone? Justin here, and in this video we're going to be going over my favorite bookish staple video of the month, which is this month's upcoming new book releases. Now normally I only have like five or six-ish uh, books and titles to talk about. This one I had to pare down for March for whatever reason. There was just a whole giant slew of like science and nature books, and I had to pare it down to I think, I think I went to 10 or 11 books and, or something like that, which I think this is by far like the most I ever had to kind of like deal with so that's awesome so let's just go ahead get right into it and i'm just gonna talk a little blurb about like each of the ones otherwise we're gonna be here for a thousand years and we don't want that so let's just get going so first up is close to home the wonders of nature just outside your door by thor hansen now thor hansen is an excellent excellent nature author i think i've read three of his books so far uh, including hurricane lizards plastic squid um, I think I've read his book, Buzz on Bees, and I do have to read this one that I have on the evolution of feathers here. Um, I think he's a fantastic nature writer. He's got a really good blend of the hard science with the narrative storytelling in the books that I've read by him. Highly encourage anyone to read Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid for sure. So definitely be checking that one out. It sounds like it's all about, uh, you know, I have a few books on, you know, backyard, kind of like nature ob observation and stuff like that, kind of identifying your local stuff and kind of like what to look for and everything. So sounds like it's kind of in that vein, but with his spin on things. So uh, definitely check that one out from Basic Books. So next up is, I know I got, <laughs> I feel bad. I'm looking down because I got my like little journal because like half these science books books have really long subtitles so I have to write them down. We got uh, from Viking Press, How to Feed the World, The History and Future of Food by Be Vaclav Smil. Now this is all about, you know, uh, like historically from like the research and stuff I've read, generally food production uh, and output kind of goes up in like a linear kind of manner whereas the population especially like in the 20th century was very exponential um, so like the population was out outpacing uh food production and stuff uh, but then you had like kind of the green revolutions and stuff uh, especially with uh like drought resistant crops and rice and things like that uh but we're kind of i th I, I assume we're approaching uh, i guess i haven't heard too much about it uh, until i saw this book um but this book is all about different techniques uh different farming methods uh, and different technologies and stuff uh, that can kind of help pave the way for the next kind of uh, generation or two as far as uh, kind of like a new green uh, revolution and stuff. Uh, but I think a lot of it is going to have to deal with more like logistical types of things and stuff because um, I do believe we do make plenty of like raw food if that makes sense uh like you know actual like you know caloric output per se um it's just getting it to the right people um and populations and stuff it's not equally distributed um and balanced like throughout the world and stuff like that so i think that's what this book is going to be um about quite a bit as well but it definitely sounds interesting uh, i've been reading a lot of kind of like social issues and stuff like that and i feel like that one kind of fits in there uh a little bit uh next up we have doctors by nature how ants apes and other animals heal themselves by Jacques Derude. Uh, this is from Princeton University Press. Uh, this is just, I don't know, this just seems like it's going to be a really cool micro, uh, like micro, I was going to say micro history. It's like a micro science topic. Um, and it's all about how uh, different organisms around the world um, utilize different techniques, uh, utilize you know, the pharmaceutical properties of like the plants and stuff around them to kind of heal themselves of, you know, different ailments uh, and problems and things like that. Uh, so I think that's going to be really cool. Um, I know insects sometimes use uh, different things to kill bacteria, like in their hives, like with ants and bees. Um, you know, different plants are usually ingested uh, to help like kind of heal with parasites, stuff like that with uh, different uh, mammals and things. So I don't know, it just sounds really cool. If it sounds like an interesting topic, that's probably a go-to book for you. Uh, next from Smithsonian Books is Supermassive, Black Holes and the Beginning and End of the Universe by James Trefill and Shabita Satyapal. Uh, so I've been doing kind of my science reading challenge. And fortunately, this month here, there's actually a few physics books and a few chemistry books. Um, some of those harder sciences, I just don't, ha I have a lot of nature, a lot of biology, a lot of ecology, stuff like that. Not tons and tons of, you know, the astronomy and physics and chemistry and that kind of stuff. So uh, I was kind of glad to see a few things like this. Um, I will say out of those, like kind of the more physics and chems kind of side of things, the physical sciences, um, I do enjoy uh, a good astronomy book. I feel like this is, uh, I don't know if I've ever read one specifically on black holes. 
Um, so I think if I had to guess, there's probably a lot of rumors and myths and like legends and uh, stuff that I probably have like, heard and stuff that are not true and need to be debunked and that kind of thing. So it's all about black holes and quasars and like how they're created, uh, how black holes like fall apart, like how they, I guess, collide and stuff like that. I don't know. I was going through like some of the description stuff and some of it was kind of going over my head as far as like I didn't even know like certain uh, certain things could happen to black holes like that. So I think I'll definitely learn a lot if I pick this one up. Um, and black holes are just like one of those like perennially interesting topics, you know, like dinosaurs, right? You know, you can't like pass up a good book on dinosaurs. I don't feel like you can pass up a good book on black holes either. Uh, next up from Avid Readers Press, we got Abundance by Ezra Klein and Derek Thompson. So this is definitely one of those ones in that social issues uh, kind of context I was talking about. Um, and this is about how in the modern age here in the 21st century, we generally have an abundance of supplies and material uh, and the governments have like the monies and stuff to kind of deal with a lot of these problems, but we're not dealing with these problems, you know, like for example, like the housing crisis, the climate crisis, all, you know, water crises and things like that. Um, but we generally have the capabilities to be kind of dealing this. We have an abundance of like I said, of, of material and resources to deal with it. Um, and it's just like not happening. So I think that's kind of what this book is about. Um, but like I said, just a bunch of different societal problems that if we kind of repurpose the way <laughs> we utilize the, you know, the abundance that we do have, we could probably fix a lot of it. So uh, I don't know too much about it other than that, but I feel like it felt like, definitely felt like in that kind of vein. Uh, next up uh, is one of the chemistry ones that I was talking about, and it's white light, uh, the elemental role of phosphorus in our cells, in our food, and in our world by Jack Lohman. And this is from Pantheon Books. Now, uh, I don't know a whole lot about phosphorus, <laughs> as I was kind of talking about. I don't know much about chemistry. I'm like vaguely trying to remember my like chem courses in college, but it's it's not. It's my recollections just like aren't. <laughs> happening there um all i know about phosphorus off the top of my head is like our bones and our teeth use phosphorus and phosphorus is one of the letters <laughs> on like fertilizer bag i don't even use fertilizer but uh i know it's like nitrogen pot phosphorus and potassium i think um on the fertilizer bags and stuff so plants must need the phosphorus for something or other uh, i feel like i probably read that at some point and just like forgot and stuff but uh anyways i feel like you know, this is just a good chance to look at one of our, like, fundamental, you know, elements and learn all about it. Uh, and it would be, like, a great fit for some of my chemistry reading that I plan on doing. Uh, next up is the other chemistry one. This one is also from Viking, and it's Carbon, the Book of Life by Paul Hawken. So carbon uh, does get talked a little bit more about in, like, kind of biology and ecology and stuff. Uh, it's just, like, one of those elements that is readily able to bond with all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, that's why on planet Earth, at least, you know, car like, life is carbon-based as far as, like, a lot of our molecules and that kind of thing kind of going on. Uh, other than that, not 100% sure... <laughs> know that much else about carbon i think the only thing i remember reading is like silica is like the next one below it like on the periodic table as far as like bonding and stuff but silicon's obviously a lot heavier and that's why carbon is like the go-to one because it's the lightest one with like the perfect like availability of like electrons to bond and stuff like that but other than that i don't know why it's like super important per se that carbon is kind of like the basis and like of like you know kind of the structure of life on earth and stuff but this book will probably tell me why it is so so that's why i definitely want to be picking that one up so i feel like that one's probably gonna be a good blend of the chemistry and the biology uh so there we go uh let's see next up we have an act we have a couple history books on here like i said this month was just super full of science for whatever reason uh, we got the Mesopotamian riddle, an archaeologist, a soldier, and a clergyman in the race to discover, or excuse me, decipher the world's oldest writing from Simon and Schuster. So this is all about in the 19th century when the Victorians were kind of going around uh, Egypt and the Middle East and kind of doing their uh, like official tomb raiding and stuff when archaeology was still kind of in his like infant days and stuff uh, and this is all about uh, kind of the decipherment of uh, a bunch of different cuneiform scripts uh, that took place during the mid and late 1800s so uh, I, it's not I read quite a bit about like you know the ancient Near East per se proper but uh, I don't think I've read much on like kind of the archaeological discoveries 
um, you know, like understanding the linguistics, how that like came about. The only one that I've read a little bit about is uh, uh, with the like the Proto Greek, like linear A and linear B. That's like the only one I can remember really ever like reading about. So I think it is gonna be kind of cool to learn about all the different kind of cuneiforms that you know that were taking place in you know Sumer and Babylonia, Assyria, and stuff like that, um, and kind of learning about how we figured all that all out and no, no, can read them. Next up is, doo -doo -doo -doo, we got The Ideological Brain, The Radical Science of Flexible Thinking by Lior Zmigrod. And this is from Henry Holt uh, and Company. And this is all about, this is like a blend of philosophy and like neuroscience and politics uh, and like the nature versus nurture argument and stuff. And it's all about how people come to hold different ideological positions like all over you know the left right spectrum and i don't even think it's just politics and things it's just like all kinds of different belief systems and whatnot uh how that comes to be and it's kind of like like i said the blending of the biological component and then the environmental components like as you're growing up and different things you're exposed to and stuff so it just sounds really cool and it i think it'll hopefully explain why uh you know why facts don't really matter in a lot of situations why facts don't really change positions why debates don't really do anything stuff like that so i don't know it just it feels like it's like i said it's gonna be one of those kind of pseudo philosophy books but also kind of dealing with like hard sciences and things so uh that's why i want to pick that one up at some point as well and then lastly, we have Life in the Great Viking Army, Raiders, Traitors, and Settlers by Don Hadley and Julian Richards. But this one's from Oxford University Press. So the Great Viking Army, for those who don't know, was in, I think if I remember correctly, in the 800s, maybe the very early 900s, but I think in the... Um, mid to late 800s there was you know the great heathen army uh that was kind of rampaging across england uh, uh or what would become england in the british isles and stuff uh, and you know eventually established uh the dane law and you know had settled about half of the isles there um as part of its like you know own like kind of norse viking territory and whatnot and you know and it's obviously like alfred's kind of battling and uh treaties with uh uh the northmen there kind of like you know make him the great and stuff like that uh i think this is gonna be a cool like kind of mixture uh with a lot of uh like you know i'm sure there'll be some of the political military stuff but it sounds like there's gonna be a lot of the material culture and, and everything and i think vikings are just a really good um culture to deal with um as far as uh, material culture and like kind of the objects that they've left behind because we've been able to find quite a few different caches of you know stuff that they've had uh in different remains and stuff but they also did do they did a ton of like pillaging but they also did a ton of trading um you know using the different river systems throughout europe and stuff so you get just a just a really good wide variety of stuff from like all over the place and whatnot so um i'm always on the lookout for like a good perfect not maybe not perfect isn't the right way but like a gold five gold star read for uh viking culture and i haven't found one yet. i found a, part, a couple pretty good ones but still haven't read like just an absolute five star uh read on the vikings in quite some time so there you have it. there's 10 or 11 books that are coming out here in march of 2025 let me know if any of these sound cool to you um like i said there's a lot of good science ones which lots of times it's usually the history that kind of takes over but i felt like science for whatever reason just like had its heyday this month so let me know if any of these sound good to you or if you know of any other really good nonfiction books coming out here in march let me know down in the comments below and whatever you end up reading this month always remember read victoriously <laughs>